So, choc, uh, libraries. Um, I, I, I usually, if someone asks me what I do, I usually say I'm, uh, I'm an audio developer. But actually, when they look at actu everything I've actually done, um, most of what I do tends to be uh, library development. Um, you know, when I did Juice, probably 90% of it is not audio. It's, it's all about being a library. Um, attraction, we, melted, we made a product, and then we couldn't help turning it into a library because that's how me and Dave think. And um, so that became a library. Um, the SoundStacks was doing C major stuff, um, which is um, a compiler, but actually we've got a library in it. And, um, half the, and we have an API for it, so it's also a library. So I'm just, I, I, I'm just going to have to face it. I'm, I'm a library kind of person. So why am I here today doing a talk about a library? Um, I accidentally wrote one again. Um, it's, uh, it's a, I'm just saying maybe this is a cry for help. Uh, but um, <laughs> thank you. So I wrote another one. Uh, if you're looking for a talk about, oh, this is the future of everything, this is the new thing in audio, this is not that talk. This is not going to change the world. This is, uh, this is a boring library. Um, it's uh, not going to be the future of coding. Um, but most of what's in it, and probably most of the people in here, because you're, you're the C++ crowd, um, most of you are probably going to at some point need something that's in this library. So um, I kind of think of this as a sort of um, public service announcement talk. Um, and also, hopefully, it contains a few things that are hopefully interesting to actually talk about and to show you which are, can be fun and uh, I, can, I can have a bit of a laugh about. Um, if you've got your laptops, oh, none of you've got your laptops open, good, you're not you're paying attention. So, but if you did have, you could go to this and this, uh, the GitHub repo here and actually have a look at the code and, um, and see what's in there. So as I'm talking about things, you might want to have a, have a poke around. Why bother? Why write another, why write another library? Um, I guess the mistake I made was that I had a bit of code lying around that I was using, that I needed for things. And um, I sort of idly wondered to myself, oh, you know, imagine if this folder full of code was a library. You know, what would I call it? Uh, well, you know, I, you know, shower thoughts, like, oh, oh header-only classes. Oh, actually, a really good name. Um, and once you've got a good name, your stuff, you have to do it. Um, and Chalk, for me, that's appropriate. I don't, anyone who's actually had to share an office with me at any point knows that, like, mo like some, some people... All that code is caffeine fueled. Mine is just like bars of chocolate. I, it's, my, it's my coding drug. Um, but really, every, the, the point about this library is everyone needs um, boring bits of functionality from time to time. Um, and the standard library has lots of boring functionality in it, but there's always stuff that's missing. Um, you know, you're kind of, I mean, normally. You know, you, I, I need to trim a string. I need to trim the white space off a string. I need to join some strings together with a with something in the middle. Or you know, I need a com smart pointer again for you know. I don't want one, but I need one. It's boring. I have to do it now. Normally, I'd reach for um, for juice, um, which has got lots of the bits and pieces that you use in day to day life. Um, and if normally, if it wasn't in juice, I'd write it and add it to juice because that's why. I, been doing for 15 years. But um, the last couple of years, I found myself in a position where I wasn't using Juice and couldn't, for various reasons, use it. Uh, so you know, I found myself, what do I do? I need this stuff all the time. Now, some things are just so easy, so trivial, that you kind of just write it. It's a five-line five line function. You just write it. You don't think about it. You move on. Um, but others, and others, are so complicated that you know, it's a no-brainer. You don't write it yourself. If I want to, if I want to play back some video, I'm not going to write a video decoder. I'm going to go and you know, get FFmpeg and sigh and deal with that. Um, but there's a kind of middle ground of stuff that's, you know, it's smallish. It I could write it. I know how to write it. I don't want to write it, but I can. Um, but it's also things that are more general purpose than whatever you're working on. You know, if I'm writing a compiler and I need to join some strings together, you know, the joining the string function doesn't go in a compiler. It's not part of that project. It sort of go, goes somewhere else. 
And a lot of these things are stuff that you're definitely going to need again in the future. You know, whatever I do in five years' time, I'm going to need to join us, trim some white space off a string. Um, so for those gray areas, I found myself looking around for third-party libraries. And um, the, the magic of the internet is that you, you, you can always find the library. Um, but they'll generally be bad in one of many ways. Usually, there'll be a pain to add to your build. I mean, it just goes without saying. They're going to be, they're going to be either um, horrible CMake files, hor just something about it will be horrible in terms of getting into the project in the first place. Um, they're almost all seem to be written in C. I mean, all the, all the really common stuff. Why do people write in C? Why would you write a JavaScript engine in C? It's like the worst. They've got bad, ugly APIs, big piles of macros getting pulled into your global namespace. They're full of compiler warnings. But, I mean, even the good ones, even the, even the good stuff. Um, just downright crappy code when you, get, when you actually start looking inside them, just horrifying things. Even the good ones. So sometimes I'd find like a header-only library, and I'd be, oh, great, it's header-only. I don't need CMake. Look at it. It's C++. It's well-written. It's decent. It does what I want. And then you find it's got a, a license. It's GPL or something. I can't use it in my closed source thing. Um, Boost is obviously great. But again, like we had to pull Boost in for some server stuff, and you get Boost, you get one Boost library. All these other friends come along, and they're all on their sub repos, so, and your build takes five times longer than it did before. So anyway, I, was, I started thinking, like, what would my, um, I don't know if you know the reference, but there's a famous George Orwell um, essay called The Moon Underwater, where he talks about his, his perfect pub and how, you know, what they would sell in this perfect pub and how cozy it would be. And so I think, you know, what my moon underwater library, kind of, what would it look like? It would certainly cover a good range of you probably are going to need it tasks. So, you know, stuff that you, everybody's going to need. Really boring stuff. Um, it would have to be modern C++, at least 17, um, but probably not 20, because even now I'm struggling in some of the stuff I'm doing. To, I, can't, I can't use 20 in places. I'm still stuck on 17. But definitely not C, thank you very much. Definitely be header only. You, I want to hash include this stuff, and that's it. I even, it, chock, I even put that into the name. I'm sticking with the header only um, concept for this stuff. And I want it to work in all the reasonable, all the normal compilers that we all use, um, without any warnings, no faffing, please. Just include it and expect it to just quietly do its job. Um, I want this thing to avoid any external dependencies as far as, as, far as humanly possible. And I'll talk a bit, in a, a bit, um, a bit later about some, some tricks I've used for that in a few places. And I think it should also have minimal internal dependencies. Now, um, you only, pay for, you only pay for what you use, is the kind of acronym that I'm sure I heard somewhere, but I don't know where. Um, essentially, like, um, if I just want one header file, I don't want to have to bring in the other 100 of them. Now, Juice, the modules format, is really good for fast builds, but it does mean that if I, want just, if I just want to use one Juice class, I have to bring in at least the whole module and probably some dependent modules. And it's got to have a license that doesn't need approval by a legal team. I don't want to, it's got to be so simple that I don't even want to have to pass that to a lawyer to approve it. And most of all, just be consistent and be well written. And um, this doesn't exist. So I had a go. Uh, well, at least I say I had a go. I, I already had a lot of stuff. I've, and over the last couple of years or so, I can't remember when I started it, but it's, it's, it's gathered up. Um, moss or whatever a rolling stone might do. And um, we ended up with this kind of range of functionality. Um, I did this slide, and I thought, oh, this is great. Uh, look, I've listed out my folders, and I've listed out my namespaces. I can do a really quick little talk now about how you structure your projects and your tips and tricks. Like, What are the good golden rules of how to break a bunch of dis you know, very different um, library code up into modules and namespaces and things? And, um, and I thought, I couldn't think of any rules, really. Um, uh, it's, it's one of those things, like, over the years, m moving things around and making mistakes and going, oh, I don't like this in here, kind of gives you a sense of how to, how to lay things out. Um, but it, 
maybe it's a whole hour-long talk next year, like how to name things, how to put things in namespaces, how to how best to group this kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I couldn't think of any pithy, short um, bits of advice there. What I, I did go choose to go for um, lots of sub namespaces. Now in the standard library and in Juice, what you find is um, uh, they both started off with a big flat namespace with everything in it. So Juice was originally Juice colon colon everything, um, and then toward, as we went on, we started adding a few um, sub sub namespaces like DSP, and uh, and same thing happened in the standard library. Originally it was just stud, and then it started having stud file system and stud um, chrono and things like that. I just I just guess go for go for it, and there's very little actually in the choc root namespace. Um, what I found as I sort of evolved this and you know, worked on the code and moved things around and added to it <clears throat> is it all started to fall into a, a kind of common pattern. Um, and you don't, you don't have to see what's on the screen now, but blur your eyes a bit. And all the shock head files started to look like header at the top, copyright, a few includes, and then a normal C++ header style declaration. So keeping it really short, none of the, none of the actual methods in there for classes, um, uh, docs and comments, nice and readable, keep everything very short and sweet, leave a few blank lines, put a big thing that says, details, stop reading here. And then the idea is, if you're looking at one of these files to see what's in it, you can read down to there and just ignore whatever's below there, because it's probably loads and loads of rambling stuff that you might have to debug into it at some point, but you don't really have to know. All the file names start with the prefix choc. Um, and if, if, you don't, if anyone in the room has a project where you've not put your own prefix in front of all your files, please, on the way out, change that. I mean, so looking through other, the third party libraries uh, in the course of finding some functionality and getting annoyed with them, like one of my real annoyances is how many of them have names like input.h, you know, or sort of, like, how is that not going to clash with somebody's project? They, they, you're writing a library, you expect thousands of people to use it in projects. Someone's going to have a, a file of their own called, you know, thing.h, and, you know, just stick a prefix in there. And it also makes it easier to, if you're, um, oh, all sorts of reasons. I'm not going to go into that, it's pretty obvious stuff. So what's inside? I'm going to, from this point, this is where I would have put in um, a little video of my cat um, in response to Dave's talk. But I only knew the cat thing was going on today, and I've not had time to go and do a video. Maybe next time. Um, but th this is the point. I'm going to go from rambling on about it to just blasting through some of the things that are in the library. Um, so I'm going to start with talking about the big stuff, um, big in, the term in terms of um, file size and hassle it was for me to write it, and not necessarily value to you guys, but um, the, the more complicated stuff, and then some of the medium stuff and the audio bits and pieces, and then some of the quirky bits at the end. Um, so, I'm going to start with um, some of the big non-audio things. The um, first of those is a um, bit of an odd one to start with, because I'm not sure how useful this is going to be to a lot of people, but if it is something you need, it's really useful. Um, <clears throat> this thing is um, it's a, a, a structured data object called value. Um, we have a value and a value view. Um, and this is a, kind of like strongly typed JSON, um, in the sense that you can turn it into JSON. I can parse JSON and get a value. And I use it for JavaScript um, engine interaction. But it's stronger type than that. So you've got it'll know it knows if you give it an in 32 or an in 64 floats and that kind of thing, balls. So things that JSON loses, it, it actually um, it actually stores. It can be structured structures with arrays, and it also knows about vectors as a special type. Um, and the, the kind of, it's not just um, I, the, the way you like if, you, if I said write that, the typical way to write it is you'd have an object with some pointers to some stud vectors of things inside it and pointers to other objects. But the, the point about this one is the, the structure of a value is a type, some information about the type of the value, and then a contiguous chunk of data, which is packed and tight. And the reason we, 
I'll, I'll explain in a minute. That's useful when you're passing these things in and out in a real-time context. And we needed it for C major to actually get typed values in and out on a real-time thread. So although it is a, J a JSON object, it's a very specialized use case. So if you add it, it's very good for handling things with a fixed memory layout. So if I have, um, uh, uh, if I have C major is a good example. If I'm emitting events, and they're all the same, they're all the same fixed layout, very, very low overhead to just create and generate those, those objects and pass them around and ask what they are and do that kind of thing. Also, it, it's um, things like float and interarrays are packed. So if I get a float star from the operating system and I want, I can in, just point to that and wrap it in a value view without any copying or allocation or mem copying, and and then pass it into all my code that just takes general purpose objects, but without having to copy the actual data. Um, and also, they support custom allocators so that if you're creating these on these things on an audio thread. You can have a pre-allocated little block, so you don't have to allocate on, on the audio thread to use them. But they're not very good uh, for times when you have a, a JSON object, like you would in a JavaScript engine, and you're adding and removing properties. Not very good for that. It'll do it, and it's fine, and I do use it for that, but it's not its strength. Um, so it's a funny one, but it is. I did have to write it for, what, for our use case. It's probably useful for someone somewhere. Uh, and I also used it for the, the next bit, which is the top JavaScript engines. Um, <clears throat> so for this, I needed JavaScript. And um, <clears throat> I think we started off with the duct tape engine. As There's, there's about three, maybe four, um, open source JavaScript engines you can that are embeddable. I mean, there's things like V8 that are enormous, and I'm not going to attempt to embed that. But if you just want a quick and dirty JavaScript engine to put in your app, then um, your, your choices are duct tape, QuickJS, and I think there's one called Hermes or something. I started with duct tape and hid it behind a common API. Um, and then realized that duct tape had really old fashioned syntax and we wanted the new stuff. So I thought, oh, OK. So I got QuickJS. And now, so now what we have is um, two interchangeable engines that you can pick whichever one you want, or both if you want, uh, behind the same API. And it's this. Uh, to use it as simple as like include your, include your um, the engine you want, create a context, do some JavaScript, and they're header only. It, it literally is just include that file, you're done. And uh, if you go and actually look inside those files, there's a lot of lines of code in there. It's pretty horrible. Some C, blah, don't don't look too far down the file, but it works and it won't do any warnings. And um, it really is as simple as include it once. It, yeah, <clears throat> and it, even though like including a sixty thousand line header file is not great, you only have to do it in one of your compile units, and then all you need for the rest of it include the JavaScript to H, and you're done. So it's actually pretty pretty much as cheap as um, adding it to the build in the old fashioned way. Uh, the other thing I needed to do that was a total pain was I need to pop up a web view. Um, it's pretty, you know, these days, you're all going to want, at some point, to pop up a web view. Um, I needed to do it without juice. And I also needed the, um, it to handle the latest Edge browser on Windows. Um, now, th this, is, this, is, this, is a, this is a juicy bit. Because if you've ever tried to embed the Edge browser you, on Windows, you'll know that um, to compile it, you need a Microsoft SDK installed. And when you deploy the app that uses it, you need to redispute a Microsoft DLL alongside that app that you, that, that you talk to. Not with this. <laughs> uh -huh. Include webview.h. That's it. You've got, web, you've got um, Edge on Windows. Um, I was taunting Tom um, the other day, about yesterday, about how, uh, how I did this. And I said, don't go and look inside the file. It's, it's horrible. Maybe if anyone's got the laptop open, they can, they can see what I did by the end of the talk. And win a prize. It's uh, <laughs> it's horrible. Uh, and I'll talk a bit later towards the end about one of the things I used to make that that, that abomination happen. Um, and then of course you get a web browser. I didn't want to get do this. It's a slippery slope towards creating a UI framework, which I am not doing. Um, no, I'm not doing it <laughs> ever. But I did need a message loop um, to get the web browser going. And um, and I thought, oh right some nice little timer classes. So if you just want to spin up a message loop, run some timers, um, we got that. 
Okay, I think I'm more or less on time. There's a load of, load of stuff to get through here, and I'm going to maybe speed up a little bit. <clears throat> Next bit, uh, audio, let's talk about some audio things that are in here. So first of all, the basics. Like, I have written this so many times, and I'm done now. This is it. This is how I want. This is, this is finally buffers, the, the buffer abstraction class, but I'm just done with. I mean, I wrote the, I think I did one before juice traction, and we did the juice audio buffer, and then we realized that was wrong, and we did the juice DSP buffer. And then, uh, I don't know, I've probably done a couple more on the side. I think we had another one in traction. And now it's like, OK, this is, this is, this is how, finally, I've made all the mistakes. Um, these are some classes where you can declare either an interleaved or a discrete set of channels. Um, they can either point to some data that they don't own, or they can, or there are um, uh, help classes that allocate the data and pass it around. Um, it's all templated. There are free functions to add and copy and clear these things and, uh, and to merge them together. Um, and they work, and we've been using them for a while. We started using them in the Traction Engine as well. And um, yeah, you should use them. And yeah, nobody should be using float star star. But um, yeah, use these instead. So what you do if you're not using Juice and you just want to read a file, a WAV file, from, or maybe an OG file from disk, um, you know, so I thought, well, my, in my use case, I was emitting code for Sumoja where a user would compile this code. That code that they compiled would then have to load some WAV files. So it's like, OK, see what, see what the options are there. And then they're not fancy. Like, I'm not going to go on. You know, no way we're going to going towards FFmpeg for this. So you start looking at uh, like the lightweight libraries that are out there for um, audio file reading. And um, oh, they're terrible. I mean, it seems like most people use um, libsound file. But I mean, that one failed at the first hurdle by being LGPL. And I couldn't, couldn't use it for that reason. It's also C. And it drags in a load of um, like obsolete formats that were used on like 1990s Unix workstations. So like a, a bit of grumbling, I thought, OK, just tackle this one head on. So what we've got now are um, some audio format classes. Um, very simple. There's a, I think it's a little bit more in them than this, but you, hey, audio file reader, get me your properties. Uh, read some frames. Read the whole thing. Uh, create an audio writer. Write some frames to it. Nice and easy. And I've got four, I think four, yeah, uh, four different formats at the moment. And each one of these is a header-only file. So if you want to in, in, use web files or arg or flac or mp3, you include that whatever it is, .h. And you can include any, they're not inter interdependent, use whichever ones you want. And um, not really nice and easy to read and write from them using the buffer classes that I just mentioned. And they're not even very big. Um, well, org is the biggest. And again, these are header only. I've kind of hammered that square peg of all of these libraries into the round hole of being in a header file and hidden all the horribleness got rid of the warnings, and it really is nice and simple. Um, another sort of helpful bit here um, that I've done many, many times over the years is I'm trying to play some audio and some MIDI. And um, go to, we've got buffer, buffer callbacks, and I've got random thread giving me MIDI data. And um, you need to kind of synchronize the incoming MIDI and um, put them into buffers and actually synchronize that with into the callback. So I've, this audio MIDI uh, block dispatch is a kind of <clears throat> nice little templated abstract way of doing that, which is handy. Nothing much to say about it. Useful. We use it in our uh, C major player. Apparently, people still use MIDI. Um, I've heard, I've heard that they even have a new version out. But, um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan, but you have to get it in and out, and you have to abstract it away somewhere. So um, not much to say about these. Go and have a look at them if you want to do that. But um, uh, this time around, I've got, I, I decided to split it up into a short message and a uh, message which could be any length. So um, keep the sysxes separate from the short messages, because I found that most of what I have ever needed to do is not sysxes. 
I threw in a file writer and, um, and a way of handling MIDI sequences. Um, it's, it's boring. It does the job. Everybody needs this from time to time. Nice and simple. Again, one, uh, one header file. Um, I'm not trying to be far bot or um, do any of um, the, the really clever FIFO um, lock free stuff like Fabian does. But um, I did need some FIFOs myself, so I threw in some of the ones that, that, I, um, that I needed. So really simple stuff. The one I've ended up using a lot is this variable size FIFO, which is um, <clears throat> it, it's just a FIFO, but you can, you can put objects into it, which is just chunks of memory. But they can be any length. And when you get them out, it tells you how long the, the chunk was. So if you're pushing, say, MIDI or um, uh, variable length events or something into, into a queue, it just takes care of that. It's much easier than um, having them pointing to objects and of different types. And the other one here that's quite useful, might be handy for people, is dirty list is when you have um, a big set of objects which may become dirty, and you need a thread to come and clean up the dirty ones. If that list is very big, um, say, if you have, if that list is a, your list of parameters in a plugin and you have 50,000 parameters, uh, in a lock-free way, being able to mark them as needing attention and then come and, and come efficiently find the ones that need attention is actually trickier than it sounds without having to traverse the whole list every time. So this is a kind of uh, a, optim a more optimized way of doing that. <laughs> I threw in, um, there's very little DSP in here, by the way, but I did throw in um, a sync interpolator that, uh, that Ches wrote, and I cleaned it up, and it's very neat and small. Um, you know, your, the perfect sync interpolator would be perfect quality, really small code, and very, very efficient. This is kind of, this is perfect quality uh, and small. I think you could, I looked at, um, uh, what's the one, a lib sample rate, which does this, and it's, uh, I think it was like, 300,000 lines of code, which was all just tables. And so I think that's probably the, a more efficient way to do it. But for like a 100-line um, piece of code, this is, um, this is probably not quite fast. But it'd be interesting to benchmark the two, actually. Um, also in here, the, my, um, the channel buffers I was talking about earlier are the floating point ones. But occasionally, you need to interact with the outside world. So you might need to pack uh, sample data in and out of various types of floats, uh, various types of integers and lengths and white orders. So we have um, a bunch of stuff to do that. But again, bread and butter stuff. And if, if you need that, go and have a look at how that's done. Because again, that's something I've written a million times. And it's like, OK, I think I know how to do this this time. Um, it should be right. Okay, the next bit, random shrapnel. So this is kind of not non-categorized stuff. Um, loads of string functions. I not being able to use juice string for a while and using a lot of stud strings, I found like it doesn't do anything useful. Uh, so I wrote lots of free functions and kept adding to them when I needed them, and I put them all in uh, a nice little helper helper string.h file. Um, and it's stuff like it's stuff you know, everyone's going to have to write out at some point. Like that took so many minutes and seconds. So they just get me a duration description from a std chrono object, or here's the size of a file. Give me like a readable byte description. Um, a wildcard file matcher. I mean, it's like 20 lines of code, but you've got to have one. You need one sometimes. A base 64 converter. These are all like really none of this is rocket science, but um, just having it all to hand in a in a simple way. Um, it's pretty useful. Uh, one, that, one that I'll give a little special mention to is I am quite proud of the float to string, where I looked up like how to properly do the fastest algorithm of converting a like a, a round trippable um, float to a string, and so this is this performs that and um, does a really nice job. Also, stuff like. Where, who's ever not needed to just, hey, I've got a file. I would like that in a string, please. I think this, is, this is how you do it in the standard library. Like that, to read a I mean, file. And I just, it's the text, just give me the file. Or overwrite this file, please. And if it doesn't work, I'd like an exception. It's like, you know, it, you can do it. 
But it's uh, so I've written some pretty simple um, little helper files there, and it, and just to be, go, be able to create a temp file that's going to go away at the end when it goes out of scope. Um, again, something I've needed. Probably written that twice as well. Um, I've added a few things in here which are um, kind of stand-ins for because um, I couldn't use C plus plus twenty yet, and I wanted spans and I wanted some bit cast functionality. So I kind of there's a few little not as good as the standard, but kind of placeholders for that, um, that for things that I needed. So um, there's more than that, but um, have, a, have a poke around if, if you're needing anything like that. Uh, also, like the endianness is again in C plus plus twenty. And um, so, but also the, the endianness in yeah, what, what I found, again, a really common thing that we all have to end up doing is you've got a, you've got a value, you're going to put it into, you're going to you know, pack it into big or little endian memory. The standard library kind of lets you flip it around, but actually um, what I found I ended up doing all the time was not, I didn't want to use it like that. I, I want to say, here's a pointer, write this, Templated objects into this point into this point of big endian or little endian, so the, that's a, fine, a, a more useful um, pattern for that kind of uh, that kind of operation. Another quick little mention in here is that I, um, I did some variable length integer encoding, which again, probably many of you have needed that. And there's a really neat thing I learned called zigzag encoding, which is um, a way of encoding packed integers that can be negative as well. Nice little trick, and all all in there. Surprisingly little help from the standard library when it comes to Unicode. Um, so we've got um, some UCF pointer stuff. We use this, like, this is really handy for the, our compiler, where you give it a UCF8 file, and it'll kind of scan through it, and we do lines and columns. So is it valid? Um, iterate it by character. Um, not, you know, I, I'm not attempting to embed the whole Unicode standard stuff in there, because um, that's crazy. but. Uh, just the, the, the basics are uh, quite helpful. Another nice one that I, this is a, a, something I copied from the LLVM code base that I was hanging around in a lot, which is, um, and we ended up using it all over. It's just um, a ver like a standard vector, but uh, with a little bit of um, uh, small, small object optimization. So it, it has a bit of space in there. Um, and you can, you can grow it beyond the embedded space, but if you if you know you've got to have just four objects, um, you can do it. You can create one of these uh, with a preset size, so it doesn't actually have to heap allocate at all. And I use this on, you know, under control conditions. We use this on the real time thread. Um, another good, another little thing here that might be might be a, a good kind of. Um, Something if you don't already do it in your code base is just to try and get rid of those stars from your code by using some some smart pointers around things uh, like around references and raw pointers. Um, now I know that we've got std reference wrapper in the standard library, and I started using that. But then I thought, hang on, if we have our own, we can actually assert when you misuse it. So in our, in our compiler, um, we we all of our references and pointers are wrapped in these things. Well, not some references you can often get away with quite safely, but um, certainly all our pointers are wrapped in the um, in these object pointers, and it means that if you dereference it a null pointer by mistake, you get an assertion which turns into an internal compiler error with a proper um, failure message. And actually, being able to do that is really handy um, in terms of our maintaining that code base. So, it could be useful for you, you lot. And oh, yeah. sometimes you just have to use com. I yeah, sorry, but if you do, and you and you don't fancy writing that com smart class again like everybody else does, uh, you can you can use this one. Uh, this this is um, this does what it says in the tin. You're including some terrible code from that you've you've downloaded from the internet. It's rubbish. It's full of warnings. So you include. Disable all warnings, include rubbish code, include re-enable all warnings, pretend it never happened. And I've used that so many times. <laughs> uh, some, uh, in the course of doing quite a lot of threaded stuff as well, um, in the last couple of years, uh, 
I find myself wanting the same few uh, multi-threading patterns, so I've, I've put those in here. Uh, the thing I think I always seem to want to do, which we could do with juice threads, but which is very hard with the standard library threads, is just a, I want to have an object which is a thread, and I want this thing to um, do a task when I tell it to. So I call I call it on the one thread. I want its thread to just do the thing now. Call my function pointer. Call my uh, call my lambda. Or I want it to do that every so many milliseconds. Or say and then, but most importantly, when I destroy that thing, I want it to cleanly stop after it's finished and without any messing about. Now that's like acres of code to do with the standard library thread. So I've packed it into a thing called task thread um, and found out that most of the time when I need something to happen on another thread. That's probably what you want to use. Um, another really handy thing there is um, this thread, say, functor, which is a kind of wrapper around the functor. And what you often get is um, when you post um, functors to be called by the message thread later, you'll probably, um, like me, immediately have bugs everywhere when those functors are getting called later on by the message thread after the thing that they were supposed to be talking to has been deleted. And if you post something to the system message thread, you probably can't get it back. So um, if I have an object that I want to, and I say, call me on the timer later, do a thing um, to this object, give it a lambda that points to this object, delete the object, to be able to cancel the in-flight callback um, in, it, it, without any race problems, that's what this thread safe functor is for. So it's kind of a little intermediary you'd stick in in the way of a message that you're firing out um, because you know you can tell it not to arrive. Um, another one from the standard library here. If you, um, hey, ever needed to sort anything on your audio thread? Hey, use the stable, stable sort because that's how you sort MIDI messages. No, it heap allocates. Um, I was having a chat with Timur about this this yesterday as well because um, he'd hit the same the same issue, and um, yeah, I needed this, so I wrote one that doesn't allocate but does the same thing. So um, might be handy if you think you've ever used that. Just do a quick search and make sure you're not using it on the audio thread. I only found that bug because our allocator checker kicked in and said, "Oh, you can't do that." Um, handy little thing here. Um, there's a um, I needed a fast but not particularly crypto secure hashing uh, function for some stuff um, just to see just to see whether I need to rebuild things. And uh, there's a really nice thing called the XX hash, which uh, has a 3264 bit version. It's really fast um, and um, pretty secure enough for like normal day to day work. That's in there. Okay, um, a few quirky bits. Um, and some eccentric stuff. Uh, we've got a pool. Um, a lot of compilers do this. The, I, I wrote it for our compiler. Um, it, when compilers run, they tend to create millions and millions of tiny objects very quickly that all point to each other in a big orgy of pointers. So there's no, there's no point trying to, trying to own each other. And then you're done compiling, you go, boom, drop the whole thing. So we have a pool that does a very, very fast um, and single-threaded uh, allocations, and then drops all the objects at the end. Um, I don't know how useful that is to a lot of people, but if it is, if you need it, then this is, this is a really nice version of it. Here's one that if you do use Chuck at all, you should use this, because um, if, you, uh, if you do embed even permissively licensed stuff, then um, your, the most licenses, even the permissive ones, say you do need to actually put the license text, uh, make it available to your users. So what I've done here is there's a little class and a macro that, that you can use that, um, so if you include chalk, any bits of chalk that you include get marked up at, with licenses internally. So you can just call uh, chalk text, opens, get, open source license list dot get or whatever it is, and it will give you a big string, which is all of the licenses that you have used from Chalk uh, in one big piece of text. Then you can stick that in your about box, or you can print it out on the console. Uh, and if you use your own uh, your own libraries as well, you can use the add your the Chalk macro to register those 
licenses and it'll add them to the list. So um, it's just a nice little way of essentially managing all that mess and so you don't forget um, which libraries you've actually got in there. So like the things I've embedded, like the JavaScript engines and the OG and FLAC uh, decoders, obviously those have li licenses embedded in them and those licenses will appear in this list if you use them. Probably one of the least useful things to people in this room, but there's, um, we, we've been doing a lot of um, code generation, and um, that involves uh, having a stream where you're writing to, you'll say, like, start an indented block, maybe with braces, print some things in there, you know, end of the block. Um, so we've got a code printer, and it can do things like tables and uh, nicely laid out stuff. So all of the uh, C major to uh, C++ and C major to JavaScript, um, to, uh, to uh, different targets, we use uh, this code printer. Uh, useful, I don't know. Someone somewhere will need it. And also, um, uh, something we wrote for our documentation generator um, was uh, like a little HTML generator. This is not a big, not a big class. It's just um, a few hundred lines, but um, a neat way of being able to generate a HTML tree. Uh, in a kind of object-oriented way, so you say, okay, create me a, 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 a div, add some divs, add some text to them, and then, boom, dump that all out as uh, formatted uh, HTML text. Um, and we've used this for our uh, standard library documentation generator. So it's been, it's been pretty, it's been battle-tested. And it kind of, yeah, I, I don't think there's an easier way of doing this. If someone can think of a better, a more readable kind of structure for this kind of thing, I'd be interested because I, yeah, it, it's, um, it feels like there might be a more RAI style approach to this, but I'm not sure about that. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, oh, yeah, right, this one. Yeah, so I don't know if anyone's looked in that file yet, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, web, the web view one. But um, if, if, you have to, if you have to deploy a, um, a Microsoft SDK redistributable DLL with your, with your app, you could install, take that, put that file in your installer and have it installed um, and then read it. Or you could take a copy of the DLL, turn it into, <laughs> turn it into, turn it into um, an embedded uh, C++ literal, um, and, the, and then that took in DLL, in that DLL image in memory, you could load it into memory and just use it. So memory DLL is basically uh, lets you take the, the, the data of a DLL and load it into memory as if you'd loaded the DLL. Um, and then you can look for function pointers into it and things. And that sounds very innocent, but when you start thinking, oh, what can I do with that? It gets quite, quite messy because you can simply embed that in a header file. And then you've got a DLL in a header file. Said, oh, OK, I've got a few ideas for that. I, think, I, don't think, I don't think Ches will let me do it. But um, I think there are, there are things we could do there that are so wrong. <laughs> um, it is gross, yeah. <laughs> uh, one last thing. I think I'm coming to the end of it. But um, uh, because I wanted, because uh, for the CHOC CI, uh, I wanted some unit tests for everything, there's actually a, hey, we're doing everything, I'll throw in a little testing framework, and it's literally like almost no code. And how much testing framework do you really need? It's like, do a thing, is it true or false? If not, you failed. Um, yeah. did, an, did an exception get thrown? Yeah, okay. It's really not, not rocket science, but, um, so actually, I, I wrote it just to use in chalk as a, the, the most minimal testing framework in the world, and um, then we started using it for other things as well, because it's so easy. And that's it, really. Um, I was thinking, like, what, what else could I say? Oh, and coming soon, I'm not really sure. That I've got a file watcher to watch for changes to folders on disk, half written, nearly done. I'll do that next. I, I was almost going down in time for this. Um, should I do DSP algorithms? Probably not. I'm not very good at DSP. Uh, but some things like a time stretcher or could be nice to have in there, like a bad one, just a sort of... Uh, a placeholder ones, you, you just get something going. I, I don't know. Maybe. 
Um, I've thought about doing like more audio processor type classes, but again, mm, not sure about that. Um, none of this is Android or iOS. Obviously, the cross-platform bits are run anywhere, but things like the web view, I've not attempted yet to do Android or iOS versions of that or the, um, uh, or the message loop. But um, maybe I will. Maybe we'll need that at some point and I'll add them. Or if anyone else wants to add those, please, please come and join in and have a go. Um, I keep thinking a JIT engine would be nice in here because I've been doing a lot of that lately. Um, but I don't know if I'll, maybe it's more a retirement project. Audio IO devices, nope. Not, not going there. Done that. Been there, done that. Not doing that again. You can use Juice. Um, and time for some questions. And yeah, thanks very much. I, I hope this is useful. I mean, this is, yeah, it's, it's liberally licensed. I'm not doing, this is, this is, this is, not, um, this is not a product pitch. This is a cry for help. Um, it's like, uh, I've, you know, I needed this myself. Um, I wrote it anyway. And it's probably useful. So I hope it is. Hope you all want to get involved. Um, it's there on the Traction GitHub. It's under Traction for no particular reason. Again, it's like, it's not for profit, it's open source. Um, but uh, give us a star. And um, yeah, and let me know any feedback. Thanks very much. <laughs>